In module three, we're going to discuss um, curves, basically parameterization. So we studied conics so that we'll recognize some of these curves. And we're, we're looking at parameterization, specifically of curves. Now, we're going to use that word parameterization over and over again. And what it means is just that we have a curve or a surface that's, that gives our location as a function of one or two variables, which we call parameters. So they're variables on the side that kind of describe it. If it's a curve, there's going to be one parameter. We usually think about it as time, and for every time we have a particular location. For a surface, we're going to have two parameters, and given those two numbers, then that determines our location along that two-dimensional surface. So two skills that we really need. First are knowing when we're looking at a parameterization, what curve are we really describing? And there are two ways that we'll look at that. Either we're going to recognize it, uh, recognize the curve by getting um, an xy equation or an xyz equation by substitution. Um, and the other way is recognizing the curve by using some identity that helps us see what curve we're talking about. The second skill, after we, you know, if we look at a parameterization then we can identify what the curve is, the second skill is going to be if we have a curve, can we find a parameterization? And we're going to look at two ways of doing that. One of them is basically substitution. One, one of the variables is a function of the other and we just make a substitution. Um, and the other way is to use an identity in order to find a parameterization for the curve. So start off by looking at how do you identify a parameterization. Here's an example. So we, we have this parameterization. We have our location in the plane, x, y. Both x and y are functions of t. t is the parameter. Now we want to figure out, okay, if x changes this way and y is changing at the same y at the same time according to this equation, what's the relationship between x and y? And one thing that we could do is to solve one of the equations for t and then substitute it into the other. So for example, in this first one, if we start with our first equation, x is the square root of t plus 1, that means x squared is t plus 1. So t is equal to x squared minus 1. Now that we know that, we can substitute into the equation we haven't used yet to find that y is the square root of x squared minus 1. Now what curve is that? Well, if we square both sides, we have y squared equals x squared minus 1, or if we move the 1 over and the y squared over, we get x squared minus y squared equals 1. We recognize this as a hyperbola. In particular, it's a hyperbola. Now let's see, we could draw it by making a box that is 2 times 1 by 2 times 1 and extending out the vertices. We can see that when y is 0, x is equal to plus or minus 1. So we have our, um, we have our one vert vertex here at uh, 1, 0 and the other one at negative 1, 0. And then the graph must go back as we go back from the vertices, we have to approach the asymptotes, the straight lines that the hyperbola approaches. So there's, there's our hyperbola. We know that if x and y are related in this way, then they always lie somewhere on the hyperbola. But we don't know necessarily if we see all the hyperbola or in what direction do we sweep this curve along. So let's think about what part of the hyperbola we actually see. If we look at our equations here, the square root of t plus 1 is positive, and the square root of t is positive. So we know that we're, we're not going to be able to be either over here or down, down here. We also see that when t equals 0, that's our starting time, that our y value is 0 and our x value is 1. So that means we start right here on the hyperbola. Now think about what happens as t increases, where t is allowed to keep increasing without bound. As t increases, the y value is going to increase, and so is the x value. So we're going to start here, and we're moving out in this direction. So the portion of the curve is the part of the right-hand branch above the x-axis, and the direction in which this curve is swept out is in this direction, right? We're moving up and out into the first quadrant. So. Let's look at another example. Uh, here's one we can solve by substitution. Again, remember our plan is to solve for one of the variables and then plug that into the other equation. So 
we're going to solve or sorry we're going to solve for t and then plug that into the other equation so that we get an equation that relates x and y an equation that relates x and y is your typical cartesian equation we'll know then that every point lies somewhere on that graph and then we'll just have to identify which portion of the graph and which direction we're moving in okay so let's solve uh, maybe this equation for uh, t so if I multiply both sides, I get xt minus x equals t. Just multiply both sides by t minus 1. So I got xt minus x on the left and t on the right. And now let me move the t's so that they're on the same side. Things that don't have t, I'll move over. Factor out the t. t, equal, t times x minus 1 equals x. So t, t is equal to x over x minus 1. Now, knowing that t is x minus 1, we can now substitute into the other equation so that we get y as a function of x. So y equals t, but t is x minus 1, so t minus 2 over t, again, x minus 1 plus 1. Okay. Now, this equation involves complex fractions, right? Tiny fractions inside the bigger fraction. So our favorite trick for simplifying one of those is to multiply top and bottom by something that the tiny denominators can go into. In this case, x minus 1 will work. So we get this equation, y equals, let's see, x times x minus 1 would just be x, and x minus 1 times negative 2 would be negative 2x plus 2. And down here, x over x minus 1 times x minus 1 just becomes x, and x minus 1 times 1 becomes x minus 1. So we have negative x plus 2 over 2x minus 1. Now, if you think back to your pre-calculus class where you studied how to graph rational functions, functions that are ratios of two polynomials, you learned to look for um, asymptotes and intercepts, basically. So we know that there is an x-intercept when x is equal to 2 then the top is 0, right? So we know that there's an x-intercept there. We also know there's a y-intercept when x is equal to 0, which would be at uh, 2 over negative 1, so negative 2. So there's another intercept there. And we know that there's a vertical asymptote near x equals 1 half, because if x is near 1 half, the bottom will be close to 0. A regular size number divided by a really tiny number is going to be huge. So at 1 half, we have a vertical asymptote in this graph. Let's see, we know in the long run, when x is really large, you can ignore these constant terms, and you have basically negative x over 2x, or negative 1 half. So we also know that in the long run, the graph approaches the line x equal negative 1 half. From there, we can do a pretty good job of graphing this. Um, we go back, like let's say we plug in like 1 into this formula. When x is 1, we have 1 over 1. That's 1. So we also have this point on the graph. Moving back towards this vertical asymptote, we know we've either got to go up the vertical asymptote or down the vertical asymptote, but there's no x-intercept, and so we've got to go up. So we can graph this. As we come forward, we, we know we're going to cross through because it's the root of multiplicity 1, and then we can just move out like that. Starting from this intercept, as we move back, move up towards this vertical asymptote, we're going to have to go down it, because to go up it would mean we'd have to cross, and there's not an x-intercept there. As we come forward, then we know that we've got to eventually approach that line. So there's the there's the graph of this Cartesian equation, but we may not see that whole thing for our particular bounds on t. In particular, let's look at where we're at at when t is equal to negative 1. So, oh, yeah. So when t is equal to negative 1, uh-oh, y is undefined. I guess that's why they wouldn't let t be close to negative 1. On the other hand, when t is 1, then x is undefined. Okay, starting to see what's going on here. So let's try t equals 0. That's somewhere in the middle. When t equals 0, the x value is 0, and the y value is negative 2. So we're starting or somewhere in the middle, we're here, aren't we? And then as t increases, then, um, see, so as t approaches 1, the top number is getting close to negative 1, and if t is, uh, if t is approaching 1, the y value is, 
let's see, so the y value is approaching negative uh, one half. So as t approaches one, the y value is getting closer and closer to this asymptote. And what's happening to the x value, as t approaches one from the low side of one, then this is a negative number, positive divided by negative will be negative. So we can see that as t goes forward towards one, we go out that vertical asymptote, right? The closer t gets to one, the more, and more the more negative value we have on x. So it's shooting us out. On the other hand, as t goes back towards negative one, then the y is looking more and more like negative three divided by um, a tiny positive number. So the y value is going to negative infinity, and the x value, a negative one, is approaching negative one half, which is where our vertical asymptote is. So, okay, I think we now see that we have this whole branch, uh, this shape is essentially hyperbola, right, because it's approaching two straight lines just to rotate a hyperbola. So we have this whole lower left branch of the hyperbola, and we're traveling in this direction between these two values.